very good. So I'm Clarissa Brocklehurst. Uh, I'm with the uh, Water Institute here at the University of North Carolina. And I'm very uh, happy to be uh, moderating this session. Uh, the objective of this session is to share information about household water recruitment and safe storage, and in particular to hone in on the uh, potential of market-based approaches. And uh, just to give you an outline of how we're going to uh, run the session, um, I'm going to hand over in a couple of minutes to Aaron Zalzberg, the director of the Water Institute, to, to give uh, a welcome and, and an opening. Then we're going to hand over to five presenters for short presentations, one after the other, and we're just going to rattle through all five of those. Um, and then we've got a panel uh, who are going to come up and answer some of the questions that have been raised by the presentations, by the presenters. And then we're going to have a hopefully longish period of time where I'm going to hand it over to you as the audience to ask any questions you have about the presentations you've, um, you've seen. Uh, and also to weigh in on some of the questions that the, that the panelists will have been discussing. So uh, that's how we're, we're going, to, going to run. Before we start, can I just ask how many people here are from NGOs? NGOs, how many people from academia? Okay. Anybody from the private sector, except for the usual suspects? <laughs> and anybody from government? Yes, okay, great, great. Okay, so it's a, it's a good mixed crowd, so I'm looking forward to a, a great session. So Aaron, without further ado, can I hand over to you to open yeah, up? Thank you, no, and I know I only have a couple of minutes, uh, but thank you for inviting me here because uh, this is one of my most favorite topics. And you'll hear a lot from me throughout the week and certainly today, and I, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but I just, I just wanted to be here because I want to say how important I think this issue is and how excited we are to be able to bring some time and attention to it here this week. Um, I, I don't know how many of you know, but my previous role, I used to, uh, was a special coordinator for water for the United States, so I managed international water issues for the U.S. And I led the development of the U.S. International Global Water Strategy. And I always thought HWTS had to be an important part of that strategy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and really, for, for three basic reasons, and I know you guys know this, is one, it can save lives today. It meets immediate needs. Um, two, it can demonstrate that market-based solutions can work. Um, and I think that's a critical thing for us to be able to, to demonstrate. Um, and then three, it builds support and demand for types solutions. I think once communities and people realize that they can do something to their water that makes that water safe, for their children and their families. They will demand higher level services and they will pay for those higher level services. And so the, the, the value of these tools to be able to save lives and to build demand for those long-term sustainable solutions, I think is, is, is wonderful and something we don't fully exploit in a lot of the work that we currently do today around water. So I'm just really grateful for the time that you guys are taking to do this and for bringing it to our conference uh, so that we can all benefit from what you guys talk about. And, I apologize because I'll probably be leaving reasonably soon uh, because of other things and it's taking me longer to get from one point to another uh, these days, so I apologize. Um, but thank you. Back to you. Okay. Thanks very much, Aaron, and we'll understand if you have to hobble. <laughs> okay, great. So um, what I'm going to do is turn over first to Mark Sopsey, um, who is going to give us a presentation on the, on the latest research in this area. And uh, Mark, I, I'm not going to introduce all of the presenters, so if you want to say who you are, that Okay. Uh, good morning. Thanks for coming to this very first opening session of the conference. I'm delighted that you're here. Um, Mark Sopsi, I'm a professor of environmental sciences and engineering, mostly biology watch specialist here at UNC. Uh, I've been working on household water. Um, for the better part of uh, my career, uh, spanning multiple decades. I started working on household water in the 90s um, when cholera came to Latin America. Um, and I've always been passionate about this area. And I'm going to give you a brief overview um, of kind of where we are with the technologies and um, the importance of having market-based approaches to um, promoting uh, such technology for safe water and households. 
So uh, I think the first thing that we want to recognize is that the World Health Organization uh, has recognized Point of Use House of Water Treatment uh, since the third edition of the Guidelines for Drinking Water Quality, which came out quite a few years ago. Uh, I was instrumental in encouraging WHO to promote um, household water treatment, articulate what we know about it in terms of its performance, its efficacy. And I wrote a report in 20, 2002, uh, 2002 uh, which made the case for WHO on household water. Uh, what we know is that uh, there are varying degrees of performance of household water treatment systems depending upon the technologies uh, and uh, the kinds of organisms that we're trying to control, bacteria, viruses, ozone parasites. So WHO set up this three-tiered scheme uh, that grades the performance of technologies um, in terms of their efficacy in microbial reductions as well as controlling uh, waterborne disease. And that's summarized here with this three-star three scheme that you see. And then there's a whole testing program within WHO. It's, it's called the HWTS scheme. And they evaluate technologies that are trying to seek um, independent verification of the performance of their technology. And that has been very successful. Many, many technologies have gone through this protocol. And they have passed. And they are now recognized as credible options for household water. Uh, what we also know is that household water treatment and safe storage, when done well, uh, will reduce diarrheal disease. And here's a relative risk listing of, uh, of what you can achieve with chlorination, uh, solar treatment, and various types of point use filters like ceramic and biosand and others. And you can see that there's a substantially um, uh, lower risk of diarrheal disease, as summarized in this paper by Wolf and colleagues that's published in the International Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. If you need the paper, get in touch with me and I can always provide it to you, but it's easy enough to find. So this really works, and what we know is that when done properly and sustainably, disease reduction is achieved. So what are the technologies? This briefly summarizes what we know about the various technologies. There are chemical disinfectants like free chlorine. There's also iodine and bromine uh, and heavy metals. They work to varying degrees, and the extent to which they. Uh, Can you turn this on? Oh. Uh, hopefully, that's, that's better now. <laughs> I'm so sorry, everyone. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, metals, ROT, uh, strong oxidants like free chlorine, iodine, bromine, they also work. Of course, chlorine is the most widely used of these uh, oxidant disinfectants. There are physical disinfection methods with UV radiation lamps, uh, standard UV, 54 nanometer or low wavelength, uh, uh, ultra low UV, which works also very well and is safer for people to uh, be around. Uh, there are also LEDs that are available in these wavelengths. Uh, sunlight exposure works. Uh, solar radiation by putting the water in clear plastic bottles, leaving it in the sun for, the, for a day, and you get the benefit of UV radiation from sunlight as well as thermal effects because the water heats up, at least in some places. Um, boiling and, and solar cooking is another option, um, and a lot, of course, boiling is widely used. People tend to turn to boiling whenever there is a scary change in water <coughs> risk such as from cholera, uh, but some people boil all the time. Uh, it has advantages and disadvantages, but it's widely used. And there, there's biogas as a fuel source, so people who have solar cookers can, uh, can use the energy from their solar cookers to, to, to heat water and purify it. Uh, or heat. Um, in terms of physical removal, there's plain sedimentation. The old classical system is a three-pot system. It's very slow. You have to change the water into the next pot over a course of three days. Um, but physical removal is better achieved with chemical coagulation, flocculation, or absorption, and then settling, which is widely used. It corresponds to what's used in conventional community water treatment systems and municipal systems. 
Uh, filtration is widely effective. There are sand filters, there are bio sand filters, especially in HWTS. There are ceramic filters, and there are a whole line of ceramic filters, some of which are here at the show, um, and uh, uh, represented by, by others here in this session. Cloth filters will work with the multiple layer cloths, and there's carbon bio, ch bio uh, char filters, as well as membrane filters of various sizes. Um, those tend to be relatively expensive, but there are uh, options in the marketplace to actually purchase these and with a proper supply chain, they're effective. Combined treatments are multi-barrier approaches and there are technologies that use several of these steps in series. And um, that includes things like coagulation or absorption and then chemical disinfection. All of these things work to varying degree. So there are low tech options and often do-it-yourself options that people can practice at home um, boiling is most widely used. Solar disinfection is widely used. Solar disinfection with heat only is also widely used. Filtration with biosand and, and solid cloth is widely used depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh, ceramic pot filters made locally are widely available um, almost universally throughout the globe. Um, all of these work to varying degrees. Boiling uh, but, but there are cons. Boiling is, cost, is costly. You've got to pay for the fuel. That's a, that's a barrier. Solar disinfection is slow. A day, sometimes even longer if it's not clear weather. Do-it-yourself filters often remove viruses poorly, although some are better than others. The smaller pore size filters like microfilters, ultrafilters, RO filters, they can take care of viruses. But other kinds of filters, like granular media filters, ordinary ceramic filters, don't do a good job with viruses. There are solutions for that, though, which we can talk about later. Um, all filters need periodic cleaning, and that's the responsibility of whoever is maintaining and using the filter, often the homeowner, and they have to scrape the sand and resuspend it off of a ceramic filter, or they have to, uh, off a bio sand filter, or they have to scrub to clean a ceramic filter as examples. Uh, ceramic filters vary in their quality, and sometimes they break, then they have to be replaced. And membrane filters are relatively costly and they need periodic replacement, but there are now more and more of them in the marketplace. It's a competitive marketplace, so that's a good thing. Here's a summary of how household water treatment can be a multi-barrier approach, starting with the best source of water, um, transporting it and storing it safely, possibly sedimenting it, filtering it, disinfecting it, and then safely storing it, storing it. So corresponding to municipal water treatment systems, uh, there is a multi-barrier approach in household water treatment as long as people are good about following the steps and that's what communication and various types of marketing approaches are uh, important because they can encourage people to uh, embrace this approach at home and in their communities. But what we're really here to talk about today is marketing and uptake and sustainability. So we want to sell these systems to foster a sense of ownership, which is important for people to, 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 to take care of their own devices like their, their home water treatment system make the technologies and their parts and replacements widely available, accessible, and affordable. This is always a challenge, but there are low-cost low solutions and they can be effective, and marketing them you know, is uh, very important, even though sometimes they're bottoms up. Um, we want to have uh, programs to promote uh, uptake and, and effective use of these filters that are appropriately designed. Uh, we need the right software and marketing approaches for this of various kinds, social marketing, commercial marketing, marketing through governments, so on. And we want to create synergy with related wash interventions, including sanitation and, of course, the use of health education and social marketing. So collectively, if we think about all the different parts of this from a marketing standpoint, everybody has a role to contribute. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thanks for
Thanks very much. If you have questions, hold on to them, because like I say, there will be an opportunity later on. I think we've also got online participants, right? And you're collecting their, uh, their questions, so the online participants should also uh, keep uh, posting their questions, and we'll come to them later. So now I'm going to turn over to Lisa Hederich, whose last name I probably mispronounced, <laughs> Lisa, uh, to talk, uh, give us an example of market-based solutions. Over to you. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome also to our online participants. My name is Lisa Lotz, but please call me Lisa. It's a bit easier. And I'm the co-founder and director of Nazava Water Filters. And as you're probably aware, most sources, especially in the global south, are unsafe for consumption. Even if I uh, am in Nairobi, or if I, whether, whether I'm in Kenya, or whether I'm in Nairobi or in Jakarta, I ask people, would you drink water from the tap? And most people do not drink their water from the tap. And besides that, we see in rural areas, many households have water sources that look like this. And especially in Kenya, the woman here on the left, Gladys, she drinks her water directly, without treatment. So the, although there are water systems, household systems available to treat water, many of these technologies don't reach the lower income rural households. And there is a gap in the ecosystem because there is a lack of funding for water utilities to reach those lower income rural households. Then there is a lack of affordable, safe, and attractive products that are actually commercially available. So as Mark showed, we, we have, there are solutions out there, yeah? but they are not available for Gladys that lives in rural Kenya. Yeah? There is a lack of NGO and government support to promote these technologies that are out there. And there is a lack of payment schemes for lower income households to actually pay for these products as they typically cost between $30 and $50, and lower-income households do not have this money uh, in their pockets. And then there's a lack of distribution systems to reach those lower-income households, because it's costly to distribute products into rural areas. And what we see is that there are centralized solutions that work in the global north. Here in the US, most households have pipe solutions, although there's also a big amount of people that depend on a borehole. And in Europe, most of the households have actually a pipe solution into their house. <clears throat> but these centralized solutions do not always work in the global south. I've been living in Indonesia for 17 years, and in Indonesia, which is the fourth biggest country in the world, only 9% uses piped water on a day-to-day -day basis. And Indonesia is an up-and-coming, middle-income country, and it really struggles by providing pipe solutions. I live in a middle income uh, urban neighborhood and I do not have piped water in my house. I use a borehole. My neighbors use a borehole. And almost everyone I know in Indonesia uses water from a borehole as there's no sewage system. Basically, we're pumping up the septic tank from our neighbors. We pump it up through our, for our borehole. And that's the water that we use on a day to day basis. Yeah, so there is really a big problem with the water quality that people have at the household level. And what we have seen, centralized solutions like uh, the pipe systems and the electricity grid, they work here. But in the global south, we've seen that solar <coughs> lamps are now being int uh, introduced and promoted, and they have been, there's been a huge uptake because people want to have something they can control at their household level, whether it's their electricity, whether it's their cooking system or whether it's their um, water quality. And because of the lack of these solutions, households divert to water that's packed, packaged in plastic. And this contributes to the plastic soup. As the former Minister of Economy of Indonesia said, why is Indonesia poor? It is because households are paying too much for their drinking water. They get water from refill stations but very often, the water in these refill stations, actually, the quality is not guaranteed. And it's still not safe for consumption. Households in Indonesia and Kenya are typically spending like one to two months of monthly wages to purchase their water. Imagine spending a monthly wage on your drinking water. But there are solutions out there. And 
in the global north, they cost typically between 80 to 300 dollars. In the south, you see the products that are available cost between 32 to 30 dollars. These are typically promote, promoted by NGOs. However, some of these solutions are not commercially available. You cannot buy them on e-commerce sites. You cannot buy them in shops. And they are not like long lasting because they need replacements or they are, um, yeah, like the chlorine tablets or the aqua tablets. They only last for, you know, short periods of time, sorry. Or the filters already. And then you have the filters that are available on the market, but then many of them are then available in the urban areas. And then not all of them are tested under the WHO scheme, and it typically costs between 30 to 50 dollars. But we need payment schemes to reach those lower income households, so households can pay in installments, and it can be done, for instance, through partnerships with NGOs. And as you can see here, the water filter systems can be very durable and long lasting. It's a one time intervention, but then you can provide a household with two to three years of purified water. Like the, the filters with the ceramic uh, elements, they can purify 7,000 liters. You have the ceramic pots, they last up to two to four years. And then there's also the, um, the folia um, filters, which are impregnated with collodial silver, which can also uh, kill the bacteria. Those are mostly available in uh, Bangladesh. So these are market-based solutions to purify water at the household level, and they are uh, very durable. And as you can see here, if you compare home water filters to, for instance, bottled water, boiling on charcoal, or boiling with LPG, the cost per year are actually only 10 to $15. Yeah, so in the long run, these solutions are actually more, uh, less costly, if, if you look at uh, the cost per year, to, for instance, buying bottled water or um, or boiling. And what you see also is that many of these water filter companies, they have tried to make their product more, afford, more attractive because as Mark already said, ownership is important. But how do you generate ownership is if you have an attractive product that people have you know, pride in, they don't hide it in their kitchen, but they put it in their living room. As you see, the, many of our, the, the filter companies, they've started with very uh, pragmatic products, very focusing on the technology. But then we realized we need to put more attractive products in the market. But of course, that's now a way off because NGOs, they want to have quick impacts for their bucket, for their, for the dollars. But that's not per se, and it has to be affordable, but that's not really what in the long term will generate ownership. And I think this is a challenge that we need to see how we can sort it out together. So what I recommend to scale home filters is to include H2S in the GMP. We should learn from how age and COVID has been addressed through the private sector and through the public sector. I think we can learn a lot from that, to curb diarrhea and stunting. Uh, more countries need to acknowledge HW2S within their Bureau of Standards. Uh, the WHO testing scheme should be more widely promoted and accepted through national governments. More brand development is needed. And also more research on the continued use rate of these, maybe in the, at first instance, more expensive products, but in the longer term, probably more durable interventions. Thank you very much. I'm now going to turn to uh, Scott Roy, who's with the Whitman Roy Partnership, who's going to talk uh, to us about transforming sales of products for the bottom of the pyramid. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am uh, uh, from Tennessee, so this is great being next door. Last week I was in Nairobi, so. <laughs> but uh, my name is Scott Roy. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Whitten and Roy Partnership. We're a, uh, a private sector player. Uh, we uh, work quite extensively in the Global South. About 95% of our work is in helping organizations implement market-based solutions all across uh, the Global South. So we've worked in about 51 countries. We've done about 500 and 50 projects over the last 16 years, 
And uh, people ask us, well, why are, you, why are you doing this in the Global South rather than London or New York or whatever, which we used to do that. But actually, this is a lot more fun and a lot more meaningful and a lot more impactful, quite frankly. Um, and by the way, we don't just focus on uh, water, but we're in sanitation, agriculture, education, you name it. Whatever is sold in the Global South to create impact, we're, we're typically involved in. And most of the time, we're, we're brought in by an individual organization or a company or, or a large NGO that needs our expertise to help set up a successful market-based program. So today, I'm not going to talk to you about, uh, about the water uh, or water treatment or any of the other things that the experts uh, have been discussing. What I want to talk to you about is how do we get this to scale? How do we act absolutely get a product out so that we can be successful at, at, at treating the, the, the conditions that are caused by uh, water consumption that's, that's not safe? So the, the uh, title of my program today is to, is to think big. I want to think big about addressing the four billion people who have uh, unsafe water to drink. But the way to achieve that is by aiming small. And what I mean by that is that, is that there are certain things that you do when you build a business. And unfortunately, we see over and over and over again the same mistakes made across all sectors, across in, in many, many countries across the world, the same thing. It's almost like reinventing the wheel every time. So what I want to share with you today are five insights that I think could be helpful in, uh, in looking at how we can do this better, okay? So the very first principle I think is important, the first insight, is we want to make it personal. We, whatever, whatever we do to get another person to change a lifelong behavior, like boiling water or drinking water out of a stream or whatever it might be, we need to make it a personal appeal. And off, unfortunately, a lot of times when there are, are giveaways, like you know, mass giveaways of water filters, et cetera, there's an example, I think, of like 900,000 were given out and you know, a couple of years later, no, no one was using them. And uh, it, it has, all has to do with customer engagement. It's like, if I'm going to sell something to somebody, I'm going to engage with them in a certain way to understand what their needs are so that I can take my product and fit it to those needs. So much so that that client is actually going to dig into their pocket and pull out money. And you know, from the base of the pyramid, you're talking about hard-earned money and not a lot of it. So if I'm willing to take money out of my pocket, even if it's partially subsidized, that's a good sign that I'm probably going to adopt that habit and I'm also going to protect it. I'm going to guard against you know, any sort of damage happening to that. And we've seen that across all sorts of sectors. Uh, last week I was at Gogla, which is the Global Off-Grid uh, uh, Lighting Association, a couple of thousand companies there. You saw it after 200, 200 million solar lights that have been sold in uh, the, the uh, developing world, which is just amazing. So it's, it really does work. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is the, if you're going to engage a client well or a customer well, then you've got to build your people that are working on your team. I'm assuming that this is a company or an organization that is out actually engaging with the public. You've got to build their capability because otherwise what they're going to do is what they've always done if they're, if they're in quote unquote sales. And that is they'll, uh, their background probably was selling beer or cigarettes or something you know, like a fast moving consumer good. And now you take them and put them into a, a situation where they're selling into a need and, and needing to have a consultative conversation with somebody to get them to think more deeply about their habits and why they do what they do. Okay? And this also goes true, this is true for managers as well. Management that we see, by the way, this is also true in London and in the United States, et cetera. Management is so underinvested, uh, and, and oftentimes all it is is a manager who bangs a shoe on the, on the tabletop demanding more sales be made, you know, instead of developing people and helping people become better at what they do. I was very fortunate. This man, Spencer Hayes, uh, was a billionaire. He died a few years ago. He was my mentor. And one of the things he said to me, he said, Scott, is if you build people, people will build your business. And absolutely has been true for me over the last 40 some odd years. Now, this is uh, one of the more uh, sensitive areas, I think, when we talk about the poor. And that is that what price do we set a product at? So either you can come into this with an abundance mentality of saying, look, if people want something bad enough, then they're going to find a way to pay for it. 
Now, I can give you lots and lots of examples over the years of that happening. I mean, millions of customers that my clients have, okay, in, in, the, in the global south. True, it is challenging for some people to come up with the kind of money they need to, but we need to set up businesses so that we aim for a reasonable profit, which is, you know, looking at there, 40 to 50 percent, uh, on top of the cost of goods, which is what people need, organizations need to have the resources to be able to train people and to be able to manage people and to be able to have the kind of uh, financial muscle that's necessary to withstand the ups and downs in the economy, especially in the last mile of distribution in a developing country. So things like subsidy schemes and smart, you know, smart subsidies and couponing is a great idea, but they also need to be very carefully implemented so that they don't spoil the market. And I can give you lots and lots of examples of that. Um, you know, one of the things that people, I think, oftentimes in this sector fear is charging too much money because people can't afford it. And I've got a great story. Back in 2011, uh, we were working on a sanitation project in Cambodia. And uh, the, the discovery we made was that they were not paying their salespeople enough. There, there wasn't enough cash in, in these businesses in order to pay people enough money. And so what we did is we came back and suggested they increase the sales price from $35 to $40 for the easy to train. This is a sanitation marketing sale. Oh my gosh, you know, talk about a very difficult meeting to handle. And, and people just, you know, really upset that we would make that recommendation. But they implemented it. And their sales took off because their salespeople were being paid enough that they wanted to do the job of actually engaging with the public. And so, you know, if you take a look at that program, it's one of the most san successful sanitation programs in the United in, in the world. Excuse me, United States, but but uh, but uh, with 440,000 uh, sanitation installations, 440,000, and also imitated by another 800,000 copycats in the marketplace. That's a market-based solution because you see sanitation was being done by SMSU and then all of these copycats came in and started copying what they were doing. And voila, we have 1.2 million sales. And 1.2 million meaning covering 6 million people, which is roughly three quarters of the rural population of Cambodia. Okay, so it really does work. Um, this is one of the key things that we run into all the time, and that is that organizations tend to go wide they, they tend to say, look, we need, this is our territory and we need to cover the entire country of Kenya, or we need to cover these eight districts in Rwanda. Uh, and in fact, I want to tell you a story about that. Is it uh, just recently with CARE and Water for People in Rwanda, last year about this time, we were engaged to work with their team. They had very proudly said, we've, we've recruited 2,000 sales agents. We've got 10 territories and 10 sales managers. And we said, okay. After we got out there in the field, we said, well, how many are you selling? And they said, well, about 50 to 75 toilets a month. Okay, 2,000 salespeople selling 70 toilets a month. Okay, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> so when we, we came in, we, we said, look, we've looked at this and you're spread way too thin. You're not gonna hire any more managers, you don't have any money, so we need to let go of 1,900 of your sales agents. So pick the 100 best, and then let's work with them and train them. So we went through this process, you know, steps one through four, we talked about already. We closed the territory down, we narrowed the territory, and literally within three months, the sales were at 2,000, 2,500 per month. And they have stayed that way and continue to increase, even to today, okay? So sometimes our, our appetite and our passion will cause us to go and make some really stupid decisions. Like, let's try to cover everything and not have the resources, the depth, the ability to do that. And so sometimes we need to make those hard choices and pull back and, and actually make some sensible choices. So we want to go deep only after we've proven, excuse me, we want to go deep first, and only after we've proven we've got a viable business model, then we want to go wide. Okay? Uh, the last thing I want to say is that you want to build a model that is viable financially for the business. You can't go ahead and just try things and see if they're going to work. I mean, this sort of one of the things that drives me nuts is this sort of this uh, lean approach to starting a business. 
Yeah, I've started two businesses. They've both been successful. One of them's a three and a half billion dollar company today that I sold my interest in. Okay, I had partners too, by the way. I didn't do it myself. But when you get the business model right, you can scale it. Okay, but what we don't want to do is not have a business model that's working and scale a problem, because then that's even more difficult to unpick. Okay. Uh, second, we want to make sure we have our people strategy right. People are what make an organization really run. And in fact, uh, there's a great writer in business named Jim Collins uh, wrote the book Good to Great. If you haven't read it, I really recommend it, or BE 2.0, great books. He says that this is how you build a great business, is you have disciplined people, disciplined thought, and disciplined action. And I, I can certainly say from my experience that has been the case as well. So uh, we want to fight that compulsion of wanting to do good in the world by bringing in the pragmatism of what are the limits we would need to work within our limits in order to have the impact we really want to have. Okay. So I'll leave you with one simple question today, and that is how can government, organizations, etc., begin to see the patterns of successful market-based approaches and repeat that, learn from what's already been done rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Coming up with some wonderful questions for all these presenters. Uh, I'm now going to turn over to Hank Holstock, uh, and Hank, you will introduce yourself, and you're going to speak about uh, scaling sales of water filters by creating awareness with some examples. Yeah. Good morning. Um, my first contact with house of water treatment was in 1990, and that was with Potters for Peace, Ron Rivera. Uh, with the pot filters, and uh, we helped to start up local production in Ghana and other countries. Um, so that was a long time ago. I'm retired now, as you can see, but I'm still active in the house of water treatment because I think it's one of these solutions to have to, to save water. The, um, I'm living in the Netherlands, in Apeldoorn, and last week we had news that there was shit in the pipeline. There was E. coli in the pipe systems. So even in a rich country in Holland, we have problems with pipe systems, increasingly. So if we have this problem in Europe, in the Netherlands, we have even more problems in Africa. And this is a picture of people that were storing bottles. There was fights in supermarkets to buy bottled water. But the side effect of this problem was that the sales of filters went up also. So that's a positive effect. We have seen a lot of options already. I don't need to explain that filters have a huge potential. This is some general numbers, but um, there's a huge potential for good quality filters. One example is the Purit filter in India. They started 20 years ago with one model. Now they have 30 models. So there's a real demand. It's based on what people want. Now, how can we reduce the cost of filters? Because we need enough profit, but of course we still want the total price of a filter as low as possible. So one option is local production. And we have seen the production of pot filters. Um, but the other option to produce locally is the ones that were shown by Lisa. Um, I had another filter here. So these are smaller filter elements. One is the, the ceramic filters, and this one is the membrane filters, just like the Sawyer and the, I don't remember this name, what is the? Uh, village water filters. Though. Village water, so there's several small membrane filters that have very good quality and very high volume of filter production. So, why are filters common and popular in the developed world and very little in Africa. 
<coughs> there are several reasons, many reasons probably, but a main reason is the focus of governments and NGOs on pipe water. We still have the pipe dream. Everybody should have pipe water, which of course is true. Everybody wants pipe water and safe drinking water from the pipe. But the question is not whether we want it, the question is whether it is possible, is it realistic? And that's where the problem is. There's not enough money to have pipe water for everyone. A recent study says that we have 4.4 billion people that do not have safely managed pipe systems. Another reason why it didn't scale up in Africa is failures. We had in these 35 years that I work in this sector, many failures. I have more f experience with failures than with success. There is an example in Kenya where they gave away 900,000 filters, and after one year, less than 70% were working. And the reason is a range, but probably lack of awareness. There's no ownership because they were given for free. There was no supply chain. So that is, we all need these things to scale up. Another example is Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, they introduced a siphon filter 15 years ago. And in one village, there was an uptake of 95%. And the same filter in another village was less than 5%. So why the difference? So in the village where the high uptake was, there was no other source. There was only a dirty pond. So people saw the, the difference between the filtered water and the pond water. And in the other village, people had a borehole with clean water, so they didn't need, they didn't see the need to treat the water. They didn't understand that clear water can become contaminated. So how to get this rich man's solution to the base of the pyramid? We see three main actions which were mentioned partly in former presentations also, but one is social marketing, awareness. If people see clear water, many people think it's safe to drink. And they would say, my parents and my grandfather drank this water all the time. He never got sick. And then they forget about the babies. The babies can't stand contaminated water. So we need the social marketing, this awareness creation. Not only for the users, but also for the governments. Governments need to understand, as Roy said, that they have to include this option in their policies, in the national water safety plans. The next action is support commercial supply chain. Treatment options should be available in any shop in villages. And that is a challenge for NGOs. And the companies, they will do the, so the, the, the commercial marketing, but the NGOs can help with the social marketing. The third action is payment options. So for people who can pay, but not in one time, you need maybe group loans, etc. But we need subsidies for the bottom billion. The bottom billion cannot buy a filter, not even if it will cost five dollars. So we need subsidies. And then often people will say subsidies will distort the market. And we have experienced that if you do it in the right way, the subsidies can help to build up the supply chain and will not distort markets. And I will show you in the next slide, but this, these actions are mentioned in an initiative called Two with Eight. This was an idea that was developed in the Stockholm Water Week in 2022. And Two with Eight stands for two billion people can have safe drinking water with eight billion dollars. So that is four dollars per person, and it's a United Nations commitment.
So, who is going to pay for this? I don't know. Everybody who wants safe water for everybody should pay for it. And carbon credits is another interesting funding mechanism. Many of the filter producers have carbon credits nowadays. Two examples. In Malawi, we have a targeted subsidy program, a small program, and we focused on pregnant women. So pregnant women would get a voucher of $20. With this voucher, they would go to the local shop. They paid $3 and they got a filter. In Ethiopia, one minute or two minutes? One minute. Ready. Thanks for the moderating assistance. Yeah. Ethiopia. Ethiopia is interesting because house of treatment is inside the national policy for self supply. And in Ethiopia, there is utilities that admit that they cannot deliver safe water 24 7. So they sell filters as an additional service. Over 100 utilities already sell filters. And this is unique in the world. We all know utilities cannot always deliver safe water, but nobody is, is daring to say it. it's the white elephant in the room. So it's time we speak up and say, let's be realistic. And there is a local supply chain, a local producers of filters, over 700 filters, 700,000 filters are sold already. So my two questions are, can the model of Ethiopia be scaled up? And can recession result in a one page, a short roadmap, how to scale up market-based on water treatment? Thank you very much. Thank you. So our last presentation, um, before we go over to questions and to our panel, is by Shauna Curry of Cost. I'm looking for her presentation. Is that it? Okay. Thanks, Here Shauna. Over to you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, Clarissa and everyone else who's presented. Um, my presentation is going to focus on the scale component of it. And framed in the perspective, I think, for the entire session is that we're driving towards universal access of safe drinking water, of which household water treatment is a key contributor and market-based solutions are a contributor towards scale. COST is both a licensed professional engineering firm and a registered charity based out of Canada, and we were founded with this scale in mind. Um, to put this into further perspective, one of the challenges and opportunities for our sector at large is to be looking at, and previous presenters have already spoken to this, is that it's not, is often what happens is we're looking at network solutions or non-network solutions, household water treatment being one of them, and we, what's in reality is happening is it's both. Is it many pipe systems are being, are, people are using household water treatment in order to treat their water in their home. And as we have more complexity in the changing environment, in migration, in um, pipes out of service or breaking down, needing to be operated and maintained, the cost of that, we're going to, as a sector, need to be coming up with creative solutions and it's going to include both networked and non-network non systems combined. And as engineers, we're often trained on only the centralized systems, and it's hard to be viewing how do we and want to get perfect water to everyone, and how can we do that by using what might be considered unconventional or really traditional um, systems to, to, to reach people with good quality water. The demand is there, and it's growing. The cost I didn't mention, cost is the secretariat with the WHO on, for the network of house water treatment and safe storage international network. Um, it currently has 2,700 members and this is almost double what it was last year um, and compared to four years ago, which was 390 members. In 2023 alone, 103 organizations from 94 countries reported reaching 2 million people with house water treatment. 
And this is only those that reported to cost. It doesn't include hundreds if not thousands of other organizations, nor does it include the middle upper class that are using it in, the, in, in many cities. From our experience of over 20 years of uh, working in this space is that there are six components for effective house water treatment and safe storage programs. And as you've already heard from previous presenters is the market-based approach is often for the bottom of the pyramid. It is combined with other, other approaches. Um, the piece of this that often gets the primary focus is the supplying of the products and services and the financing. The three areas that do not get enough attention and need more attention are the creating demand, building capacity, and the monitoring for improvement. You heard a couple of stories already of organizations or businesses who've done this really well, where we need, and we have thousands of people to learn from from around the world, including ones that have been mentioned, and also people like Anil, who I just met in February of this year. He comes from the Western, Himalaya, Western Himalayas. He got impassioned by this area because his son was hospitalized um, and in critical condition because he drank the water from the school. The school had a filter, one of the creme de la creme, that's viewed as being top notch, um, the gold standard, it was a reverse osmosis, but it hadn't been operated and maintained properly. So we went on a mission to find other solutions. He has now, over, since 2015, reached close to 25,000 people implement, er, training his team, creating demand, which started from his own family and then expanded out, and is reaching some of the hardest to reach places in the Western Himalayas um, and has, on the monitoring side, impressive, only two, less than 3% problems with the filters. He has a hotline that have technicians come and solve those those uh, final those issues with the less than 3%. Um, in the first year, they return back to the households to make sure they're being operated and maintained properly. Um, impressive by any stretch. The filter, and there's been several that have been mentioned, and there is no silver bullet solution. We need to have many options available in the market, as was mentioned, the one that he's trained on, um, and in the in the area that he works, he can be confident that he can go back and the biosem filter is going to be operated and maintained. I've seen these working for, I just last year saw some um, from 2005, still being operated and maintained effectively with no additional intervention. I've been asked to speak on the plans on the House of Water Treatment Network. Um, very briefly is we have a lot to be able to learn from each other and um, from around the world and as you saw the membership is expanding the in, in immediate term we're host or we're doing this and we'll continue to um, host learning exchanges for household water treatment implementers Oops, the slide hasn't been updated um, and <coughs> what we're seeing emerging from this network is is sub-network, so to speak, within countries and regions to be able to big fan network in, in Nepal has been there for long standing. There's a network in, in um, India and um, being able to really facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning and um, what was I say? Oh, both in person and online. <clears throat> Make it easy as possible for members to access training, that capacity building piece, and this is an area that for our organization, um, the demand is growing for, for training and support, and so looking for more organizations in country to be able to provide this training and support in person and online. Um, interestingly enough, one of the organizations in India did an online training a couple of years ago and had a had, had somebody take a training from Ghana and now has incorporated it into the institution and all of the environmental health workers that are leaving that institution are now being trained on the introduction of house water treatment. Thirdly is advancing the testing, implementation, and monitoring for improvement, which I spoke to earlier is an un, um, needs more attention. 
the where we often focus our attention and is extremely important is the work of, of Mark Sobsey over over three decades, did you say? Um, and others, and the more recent um, work of the WHO scheme, recognize that it's in the performance testing, which is in labs. Where we need to really understand it is after it comes out of that is how does it perform in the field and to be able to really look to local implementers to understand that effectively. Um, because, as we know, it comes down to the correct, consistent, and continuous use of these products. And we have existing approaches and methodologies in the engineering design um, methodologies for centralized systems. Let's start applying that to house of water treatments for the robustness of, of, of the implementation. And the area that in um, manufacturers often have is the quality control and assurance in the factory. What does this look like at large when we're implementing within communities across, uh, across communities, countries, etc.? And the, one of the missing pieces has been in the surveillance piece to provide governments, health workers, etc., the capability to be able to go in and understand whether the technology has been work, working. And one of the efforts that we've been leading with the uh, University of Surrey and University of in Rio um, <laughs> is sanitary inspection forms for drinking water quality. They originate for centralized systems. Um, the EPA here in USA uses it, and uh, we're been we're rolling these out. Finally, I've spoken to these in different ways. Three big challenges for scale is to shift our shift our perspective as a sector to both and the get placing more attention on the creating demand, monitoring for improvement, and building capacity of all all uh, stakeholders that are part of delivering house house of water treatment and um, the widespread application of engineering design selection and rigor to house of water treatment product selection and implementation. As I said at the beginning, the market is massive. In the um, last year for non-network request, we had 80, oh, close to 90,000 people from over 200 countries requesting um, information. And year to date this year, it's 94, so we anticipate by the end of this year, it'll be even higher. Why? Because people want to make sure that they themselves have safe drinking water, that their children have safe drinking water, and they're able to um, make sure that they have livelihood, health, um, and can grow up to be healthy citizens in their communities. Um, and so it is upon us to be able to respond to this demand to provide safe drinking water, safely managed water through house water treatment, and using market-based solutions as part of the solution. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay, so I'm going to ask our panelists now to come up and join me. So we're going to have to eject you, Mark. Sure. Uh, so we've happy, got. Happy to be ejected. <laughs> happy to be ejected. Uh, Lavessa is, is coming to join us, and Lillian, I'll introduce them when they get up here. Lisa is going to join us, and Steve. And I'm just going to run through a couple of questions with the panel, and then I'm going to open it up, up to you. panel, um, we have um, Lillian Indrakua, who is with the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda, and we have um, Lanessa Maganta, who works for IRC WASH in Ethiopia, but has worked with the Ethiopian government in the past. Um, there are two people who have um, a, a government perspective. I'm going to ask them a question first, and then I'm going to go to our other two panelists, who I'll introduce. Um, but I thought what I would do first is, is turn to both Lillian and um, Lamessa. Based on what you've heard, oh, Mike, pass the mic. Okay. Based on what you've heard from the, pre uh, the presenters so far, um, what do you see as the big obstacles? There's been calls for a household water treatment and safe storage to be included, for instance, in um, national water strategies and plans. What do you think the obstacles are? Um, from a government perspective to scaling, to scaling the, um, up HWTS. And I'm not sure which one of you would like to go first. 
Uh, I'll go to Lavessa first and then come to you, Libby. Is it on? Can, can people hear in the back? Yes. Okay. I'm getting thumbs up in the back. Thank you, uh, Clarissa. Out of the three pillars for the market-based approach, which are demand, supply, and the enabling environment, government has key roles on enabling environment and creating demand. But when we look at household litter treatment and the safe storage scaling, it requires not only the enabling environment, it requires also demand creation at household level in every part of a country. It is only government who have such large network down to community level or household level in every country, in my understanding, particularly in Ethiopia, this is the case. Policy-wise, it is already there. It is already included. The gap is how to ensure policy being, is being implemented. Another aspect is on raising awareness on the consumer. Unless consumer understands clearly the value of clean water, really it is tough for them to be initiated and pay for HWTS products and services. So the challenge to me is really we need to talk and we need to raise awareness and understanding of the con of consumer about advantage of clean water. So in short, one, it is lack of enforcing policy implementation. Second, gap around raising awareness of consumers about advantage of clean water. Then they can find the solution, be it a filter, be it something else. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lubessa. Can I thank you, Lillian? Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, my colleague has already mentioned that uh, most countries have policies in place. Uh, Lisa, <laughs> you mentioned that we need to include policy, uh, household water treatment and safe storage in the policies in our countries, but we already have that. Uh, in Uganda in 2017, we developed a framework for uh, management and uh, regulation of water quality. Uh, maybe what is uh, still missing is uh, taking it further to having a regulation uh, for the household water filters because we've just been revising our water policy. Uh, once that is approved, then the attendant laws and the regulations can be developed. But we already have uh, the framework in place. Now, uh, coming to uh, the other things which we have done uh, in the ESC, a standard for potable water or drinking water, we actually have uh, water safety plans. And uh, part of that is uh, to really follow the safe water chain right from the source uh, to the point of use or in the households uh, uh, for drinking. Uh, we are also working with uh, NGOs, both in emergencies, and there are a number of NGOs, WHO, UNICEF, you said, and uh, many international NGOs and uh, uh, local uh, charity groups that are really uh, providing interventions, uh, not only um, in emergencies, but also uh, for the communities and uh, refugee settlements. Because Uganda is, I think, one of the countries that is hosting uh, a very big number of uh, refugees, mainly from uh, South Sudan. Now, the challenges of scaling up from our work. Uh, I had a National Water Quality Reference Laboratory, uh, and one of our mandates is testing uh, the household water treatment uh, filters once they are imported into the country. But that has been so far on a voluntary basis because we do not have the regulation to back. But one of the challenges we have been observing are uh, technology limitations uh, from the research, he uh, presented a range of the options uh, we have. 
uh, we have the solar-based technologies, which are using plastics. And uh, new research that is coming up is showing that there may be, or there could be, health concerns when we expose these plastics um, to solar radiation. Uh, from the point of view of also uh, the plastics being degraded into microplastics and uh, implications uh, for health, uh, including maybe they are carcinogenic. So even as we do further research, that's one of the health uh, concerns uh, with the plastic, uh, the, the technologies that are based on uh, solar or uh, heat. Then the other thing uh, we are observing is uh, with some of these uh, ceramic filters, uh, they, they seem to be leaching some ions in the water when you use them. Uh, because when we test, uh, you use raw water of average electrical conductivity of maybe 100 uh, microsiemens per centimeter, but the filtrate contains over 300 uh, microsiemens uh, per liter. Uh, per centimeter. So that, that means uh, some of the filters are actually leaching some ions into the water and that needs uh, further uh, research. Uh, for the other options that are tablet based, like chlorine, uh, the uptake is poor because the communities complain of taste. Uh, they have aesthetic issues. They complain of the taste. And they say even when they use the water for cooking, uh, it imparts some bad taste to their food. So unfortunately, uh, these tablets are being distributed by the NGOs and some uh, of the partners. But uh, during one survey, we found out that <laughs> instead the treated water is being used for washing, unfortunately, <laughs> instead of drinking. Uh, yeah. Then uh, the other challenge, I think, is related to also uh, the high cost of uh, the technologies on the market. Uh, Lisa already mentioned uh, between 30 to 50 US dollars is uh, out of reach for uh, a big part of the population uh, that is earning less than a dollar in a day. So uh, if uh, the cost of some of these technologies can be reduced further, I think that will also uh, encourage uh, the poor people who are unfortunately the ones exposed to the poor water quality and they, yet they cannot at the same time afford the technologies. Uh, these uh, technologies remain in the urban centers. Uh, instead of boiling water, the people in the cities can afford them and use it to filter the piped water. But those exposed in and, uh, to be using uh, untreated water or uh, unimproved water sources cannot afford it. Uh, the other challenge uh, we have seen uh, in the country uh, relates also to institutional mandates, uh, conflicts in institutional mandates. Um, in the early 2000s, WHO tried to come to Uganda through Ministry of Health to see if we could develop uh, a regulation for household water treatment and safe storage. Um, but the expertise and the mandate for water quality lies with the Ministry of Water. Uh, Lisa already mentioned uh, our uh, National Bureau of Standards, uh, who, are al who also have some mandate. Uh, so sometimes conflicts uh, in mandates uh, also acts as uh, an impediment to uh, scaling up. Now, last but not least, uh, government does not have uh, really adequate resources uh, to provide subsidies uh, for promotion of the household water treatment uh, and safe storage. Because the priority of government, as it is now, is really uh, for clean water and sanitation. Uh, in trying to achieve uh, SDG 6 by 2030. Thank you. Thanks very much.
that's a, an, an impressive uh, set of challenges. So I think uh, very, very useful to have us bring, uh, you know, come down to, to the reality that we're all facing. What I want to do now is I want to turn to the other two panelists. So we have Steve Buerna, who works with Rover, has been very involved in uh, uh, household water uh, treatment, and also, of course, Lisa, who you've already met, who um, is representing the private sector. So having heard these challenges from both our presenters and from our panelists, what do you think that um, NGOs and the private sector can do to, to try to overcome them? Would you like to go first, Steve? Sure. Thank you, Clarissa. Um, first off, a little disclaimer, I don't work for Rotary, I'm a volunteer for Rotary, but Rotary has a subset of the larger organization called Water and Sanitation uh, Action Group. And so I'm active in that uh, organization. So we're all Rotarians, but our passion is around water and sanitation and hygiene. And so I just want to be clear that I'm not speaking for Rotary. I don't work for Rotary. But I know quite a bit about what Rotary is doing. And I think an organization like Rotary can be a great partner to all the organizations that were represented on the panel today um, uh, and, and speaking. Because Rotary does have boots on the ground, and Rotary has a reputation that, you know, we don't always do things uh, well or correctly, but uh, people know that we are honest because of our value system and we have uh, inroads in communities and in, with government. So I think Rotary can be a great partner to help uh, bridge some of the challenges that have been <coughs> spoken to uh, just, just a minute ago uh, because uh, we're trusted. Now, Rotary um, has it doesn't focus just on household water treatment systems. It, it will work with boreholes and, and other types of intervention. But quite a few of the Rotary projects around the world are household water treatment systems. And um, you know, I think the underpinning of this whole discussion today is around how do we scale up. And, uh, and I should also say that I was the CEO of Water for People years ago and during a time when Water for People was growing rapidly. And I always felt very strongly that household water treatment should be coupled with other types of water systems because it provides either an initial and uh, a primary form of treatment or a secondary or tertiary form of treatment. So if you have a borehole, we all know that a lot of times those get contaminated with some other kind of surface water system, um, you know, distribution lines get contaminated. So I think having a household water treatment system, uh, in addition to whatever the other intervention is, is a way to make sure that the water is as high quality as possible. And we all know that water um, uh, everywhere, anywhere in the world, if people are getting it from those the sources that we saw in the pictures, it's terrible. But if there's any kind of um, additional treatment, it's better than what they were getting their water from. But I also think that uh, coupling household water treatment with other types of water systems and partnering with as many groups as possible, including some of the organizations represented on the panel today, is another way of trying to get uh, to scale up because if an organization is really dealing more with water supply or, um, or building systems or uh, de uh, developing partnerships, then when you add household water treatment, so it's, a, it's also a way of getting some scale up in uh, the use of household water treatment. And, and whatever the water source is, whatever the intervention is, it adds an extra layer of protection. So, but again, Rotary uh, is in virtually every country in the world. Um, last year, um, there was $148 million invested by the Rotary Foundation. Now, the last thing I want to say about that is um, everybody thinks water, uh, Rotary is um, uh, uh, just going to mandate across the board what clubs do and what individual Rotarians do but we're very decentralized, and that's both a strength and a weakness. So 
uh, the 148 million is just representative of the money that was matched by the Rotary Foundation out of the headquarters to monies raised by clubs. But many household water treatment systems are funded by clubs because relatively they're not as costly as trying to build a whole supply system for a community. So uh, that 148 million actually was matched with Rotary clubs uh, somewhere in the world, whether it was the US or uh, Europe or Africa or South Asia or whatever. The money that was raised by clubs, if they apply for a grant from the Rotary Foundation. So that means at least 200, uh, yeah, 200 and, uh, no, $300 million uh, was actually raised. But I know that the majority of the water wash projects that are supported by Rotary come from club donations matched by their own district's funding. So, but my, my uh, uh, encouragement is to look at Rotary as a partner because over and above the monies, the influence and the connections that Rotary has can help uh, make a project work a lot better. Okay. Thank you, Clarissa. Thanks very much. I want to leave time for questions, but I'm just going to, um, you've already heard from Lisa, so yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Yeah, yeah, and then I so, want to open to questions. What I think governments can do is reduce taxes on the import of household water treatment systems. Yeah, that would not be too difficult. It will create a huge impact on their GDP. There will be a bigger productive community because there will be less children in stand that, that can pay taxes later on when they grow up. I think the WHO scheme for household water treatment systems should be further promoted. For us as a private sector, I talk to a distributor and they say, are you tested by WHO? I say yes. Okay, then the doors open. It's really, really, really very powerful and I really hope that that can be continued because it's like one of the trusted international standards for water treatment systems. And then I really hope that NGOs can continue to create demand and awareness as we have seen with condoms, with face masks, with vaccination. Because if I have to do it as a private company, it means I will have to increase the cost of my product because I'm a for-profit social business. But then the cost of the product will be too high and then I can reach less people. So yeah, I really need to construct uh, sustainable partnerships there. But I have more to say, but I'll do that over coffee. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm looking to see if anybody's twitching, wants to ask a question. Um, I'll take a question here, and then I'll take the, one of the online questions. Do you want to just get up and holler? Oh, some yeah, sure. So uh, I'm Miles Folks, and I'm from uh, Cranfield University with the Waterwiser CDT. So I, I think this might be a kind of basic question, but from a social perspective, how do we make um, household water treatment and uh, storage systems something people A, want to use, and B, show off. And how important uh, do you think this is to clean water provision? Okay, great. Um, and did you have anybody in mind that you wanted to answer that, or um, any of the presenters? The whole panel. The whole panel. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, well, go they big. All, they all have uh, different expertise. Yes, yes. Uh, let me see if there's an online question. Actually, any. No online questions, okay, all right. Do we have another question before I, I turn over to the panel? No, nobody else is, is twitching. So who would like to uh, answer that? And the present, as, as well as the panel, we can also ask the presenters. Yeah, I, can, I thought you I might can. have something to say. <laughs> yeah, so we do not work on water supply, but basically we assume all water sources are dirty unless proven differently. Um, what we try to do to ensure people use their product is that we cater and we listen to our target market. So we have launched pink filters, mint filters, blue filters, so that the product looks attractive and that people actually like to have their product and they move it into their living room instead of hiding it in their kitchen. Um, yeah, and then we try to use like manuals that use pictograms and not very complicated language so that also illiterate people can understand how to use and how to maintain their filter. And how we make people want to use it is basically we use the social marketing skills that have been uh, presented by uh, Scott Roy, is that we actually address the problem that people are facing. What are the costs households are making to treat water, to boil their water, what time are women spending to collect their fuel wood? And when we do that calculation, and then we compare it to the investments that they have to make in a household water filter, 
those households can spend can save like 200 300 sometimes even thousand dollars by investing in a water filter so it's it's really effective communication and then having attractive products that cater to the aspirations of the customer market great thank you any yes would you like Yes, yeah, maybe just to add a little bit to uh, how to make those products uh, attractive and people uh, wanting to use them. Uh, one thing I forgot uh, to mention uh, as a challenge uh, in promoting the uh, household water treatment uh, and safe storage is uh, we are not building on the traditional way of uh, water storage. Um, in Uganda, for instance, in the rural areas, uh, people use the clay pots, uh, which also uh, cool the water. Uh, so if some of these technologies uh, somehow um, can build on that, uh, then it will be attractive and socially acceptable to the people. Uh, there is a company that is trying uh, in Uganda, they are using uh, the port. And uh, yeah, I don't know how, uh, okay, uh, we have tested the technology, but I don't have the details now. Uh, but uh, if we can build on uh, the traditional way of uh, water storage, then I think that will also make it more appealing uh, to the local people. Thank you. Great, great point. Any other questions? Yes, we've got one at the back and one over here. Should we just yell? You just, um, you just yell. <laughs> thank you all for an amazing presentation. It's a pleasure with the U.S. Department of State. Quick question. We have had a lot of uh, conversation and presentation about the technology itself and adaptation of the technologies. Is there enough conversation happening about monitoring and maintenance of this technology that are already there in the households? Okay. So a question about monitoring and over here, sir. Yeah, there was, I think, only one reference that was made during the presentation to carbon credits. And I'd be, you know, which is obviously being accessed much more frequently today in terms of standing up these, you know, sort of greenfield water uh, systems. I'd be curious in terms of the panelists' view in terms of, you know, the incidents they've come across in terms of seeing carbon credits being uh, sort of explored in the context of filters. Okay, great, great questions. Oh, and one more over here. This will be the last we'll be able to take. Uh, yeah, Kelly Schwab, Johns Hopkins University. Comment first. I think this is refreshing that we're going to a conversation here that is beyond just that we need to prove that there's technology that's needed for this critical component. And the question is going to scale and how do we market and all that. We are at a university setting. What do you guys think that the the academic approach can be to push this forward that's going beyond just the proving of it, which is incredibly important. Don't get me wrong, that's my career too. <laughs> but what can we do as, the, as groups of uh, academics to, to leverage what's going on at the government and at the private sector? Okay, three great questions. Uh, do I have a taker for the monitoring question? Sean, I'm kind of, yes, you want to speak to the monitoring question? And be real yeah. quick, because yeah. we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, I'll be real quick. Um, since I left Water for People, I've been consulting, and uh, many WASH organizations of all different sizes have been clients, but one of my clients, uh, their, their um, program was household water treatment. But uh, we came up a long uh, several years ago with the idea of using approaches that were spoken to by the panelists as far as creating businesses. But we talked a lot about in the creation of businesses and, in, and uh, helping entrepreneurs create the business to, uh, of making the filters, uh, the whole issue of uh, water quality. So we built in an incentive that, kind of like a bonus system in a way, that when the entrepreneur would go back and on a regular basis and check up on the systems that were purchased by the homes. So instead of just helping them get started and walking away, there was an incentive by the NGO and uh, the, the entrepreneur that they were helping to uh, incentivize them to go back and regularly check up and take water quality, uh, do water quality testing and troubleshoot any problems that, happened, that were occurring. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Shauna, I thought you might have something to say. And then I'm looking, after that, I'm looking for somebody to talk about carbon credits. 
Okay, I'm gonna give really quick answers to all three. First one is a monitoring and follow-up. I think this is a this falls into the same piece that Lisa commented on in terms of businesses aren't going to necessarily be incentivized to be going to create all of the awareness to create the demand, nor all of the follow-up. And this is where we really need to be looking at this blend, which I'm gonna to go to the question about academia, is to be able to help us understand what those blends are. Um, where I would be looking at, for instance, on the entrepreneurs, is there's thousands of models emerging from around the world. What can we learn from those that emerge, where there's people using Using, using a blend of the two, and um, it's a super interesting question. Along with the, the monitoring, we've got a lot of work going on in that space and could use some more, some more help. And then to the carbon credit question is yes. Um, it's a cumbersome pro process. There's an organization in Kenya who's done it successfully. They're also a B Corp. Um, they are a blend of an entrep like entrepreneurial and the, a nonprofit at the same time, and they've gone through the whole process, and now they have a have a base funding of upwards of fifty thousand dollars, which is significant, um, through the carbon credits that support the monitoring. Piece. So huge potential. Great. Okay, Lillian. Uh, yeah, just something uh, small about uh, monitoring and feedback. I think we need um, a mechanism uh, of working together uh, with the private sector or the people who are supplying uh, to introduce a feedback mechanism because in my uh, routine work we do water quality monitoring up to the household level and uh, you uh, together with uh, the Bureau of Statistics recently we did a survey and in one of the forms uh, uh, there's a question on how water is treated at the household and we found out that uh, some of the households are actually using the household water treatment uh, technologies but uh, as of now I think there's no mechanism of getting feedback back uh, the suppliers. So if the suppliers can work with the governments who are doing the routine monitoring, um, then we find a way of giving feedback on improvements and also uh, further research that is required by academia. Okay. That's great. Uh, any last words before I close? No, okay, I thought something, something cropped up. Uh, Lamessa, did you have a last word? And then I'll go to Mark and then I'll let you all go to coffee. Yeah, th thank you. My last point is about packaging household level services. Uh, imagine at household level, they need many things. Could be household level energy, could be household level water, sanitation, and others. Instead of making HWT as a standard on service, if we really need, need, if we really need impact, we need to package it with other services like sanitation, biogas, and others then it will really help us to monitor easily. That's one. Second one is about closely working with mandated water supply service providers, like utilities. Otherwise, we will end up in conflict with those mandated service providers if we parallelly promote household water filters. Thank you. Okay. Excellent point. Mark, did you have a last yeah, one, point? One last point. So monitoring and surveillance is critical to understanding what's going on in households. Can everybody hear Mark? He's, he's, yeah, they, for the online, the online. The online. Oh, the online. Very yeah. sorry. Very sorry. Apologies to the online. So indeed, monitoring and surveillance is critical, and that needs to be done as often uh, as possible. Um, it's, it's not often done because a government person might come around once a year to test water, whether it's community water supply or otherwise. Monitoring is possible with simple, low-cost tests, for example, for E. coli bacteria. There are such tests because I created one for use in the developing world. I spun off a company from UNC called Aquagenics, which has a table out there. This is not necessarily just an advertisement for Aquagenics. There are others like it, and my encouragement is that those who want water quality testing even at the household level, by whomever sponsors and, um, and, and supports it, whether it's government, whether it's communities themselves, whether it's NGOs, 
those tests are available now, and we need to make sure that, that households and communities get to use them. It's not like we don't have the tools anymore. We do have the tools, whether it's the tool that I created or similar ones from other companies, there's no reason to not do it, and it's much needed because that's the only way to know that the water is safe, where it's been used in the household. Great. Very good point. Mark? All right. Um, thanks. thanks very much to all of our presenters and our panelists. Thanks very much to you for um, your attention and for great questions. And um, uh, with, without further ado, I'll close this session and let you all go to your coffee break. Thanks very much, everyone.
Doug is the guy we're working on. Yeah, so talk academics. So Water Mission owns you guys. Okay, I will definitely. But then you need to spend three years, for instance. I think you're on to something. Like a dollar per month. Where is that? It's based the same Okay. No, no, no. Okay. 